So there's been a lot of controversy over specifically Doom on the Nintendo Switch, which has been very interesting to me to kind of watch and observe and see where everyone's coming from here. A lot of it seems to stem from the visuals, the resolution, and the frame rate. And I think a lot of people are missing kind of the big picture here because to be realistic here, this has nothing to do with the Switch from a technological level. I know it kind of does, but really this has more so to do with the ever-evolving Tegra line. The Tegra line has seen what is essentially generational leaps in the last six years. Things that generally take, uh, you know, what, PS1 to, to even Xbox One at this point in six years. It's evolved so fast. And I figure today we kind of go over it and I can show you guys exactly what I'm talking about, really where Tegra started and where it is today. Now the Tegra line started with the APX 2500 using an ARM 11 600 megahertz core. The only issue here is it really didn't go anywhere. It was originally announced back in 2008, which was pretty much the dawn of the Tegra chipset with Nvidia claiming 800 man years had gone into this but it didn't really materialize into any real cell phones or anything important. It was supposedly going to go into Windows phones and it could apparently support up to 720p video, which was a big deal at the time. I mean, we're talking like, uh, what were we talking back then? Palm Prees, Sidekick, stuff like that. So to hear that 720p video for, according to them, an estimated eight to 10 hours, that was a pretty big deal. They followed this up with the APX 2600 the following year, but again, nothing really came of it. It kind of just was announced. They showed off what they can do and then I guess they went back into the research lab and started working on the next processor. Now the following year they did introduce the Tegra 600 and the Tegra 650. These were really still based around Windows devices. See the problem at this time was Nvidia was really betting on the Windows side with like Windows uh, phones. I'm talking before even what we know now. Like not like Windows phone like uh, we're talking like the early years with like Windows Mobile 6 and 6.5 for example. So they didn't really get a lot out of those and those didn't really catch on. So it wasn't until later that Nvidia decided to really pursue Android that their Tegra line at least started to take off some. And this is where things started to get very interesting because they stopped really targeting OS level things, like I said, with Windows and attempted to start building something that could actually produce visuals that would be used in games. And that was introduced with the Tegra 2. They dropped pretty much the, the large numbers, the 600, the, the 2600. They just went to Tegra 2. It was a great move because, of course, it got rid of really the, the remembrance of all of those since this is just the second generation Tegra is how they would call it. And what's interesting here is it actually became more powerful very quickly. The Tegra 2 had a Cortex A9 which was a dual core processor at the time and it did use a quad core GPU configuration. The thing about it though was it did use lower power DDR2 memory that didn't have a massive bandwidth for memory for things on screen. It actually would sit right around 2.4 gigabytes per second, which of course is low at the time. If you think more like the 360 that had uh, over 10 at the time, this wasn't much. It also still ran on 32-bit, although at the time, a lot of phones along with Android, that's the norm and that's what they had to go with. You may remember the Tegra 2 in phones such as the Android or the Droid X2 from Verizon. That's the one I remember it in the most. And there was also the Motorola Atrix 4G. There there was also no real support from Android with low level APIs or anything, but of course people would download those benchmark programs and run them and just to see all the pretty visuals on screen and how fast it would run through those graphics tests. The following year, they went with the Tegra 3. This was first introduced in the fourth quarter of 2011, and then it really started to roll out a lot the following year of first quarter of 2012. And what's interesting here is they stuck with the Cortex A9, but they added a small core. So they did go with the big little configuration here where that one core would at least help with battery life, but they still stuck with essentially the same processor. It was more on the side of the GPU that they put in a lot of work. They upgraded the RAM to DDR3, which is like low power DDR3 in some cases, other cases, it would just be straight up DDR3, which is kind of cool. And that was more used in something like the Ouya, for example. A lot of people remember that as a joke, but it was using kind of cutting edge mobile technology then. The bandwidth has also pretty much doubled up to six gigabytes per second. The Ouya actually used the T33, giving it 6.4 gigabytes per second. Now it was also used in the Asus Transformer Pad TF300T, and then the Asus Memo Pad, as well as the Microsoft Surface and the Nexus 7. The Nexus 7 is the tablet that I remember it most in, because I actually used that one a lot when it came out in 2012. Now an entire year would pass, and then the Tegra 4 came out. It was kind of a short-lived, uh, really a short-lived SOC here, because they didn't use it much. They really pushed it in the NVIDIA Shield Portable and even in the Tegra Note 7 and the Surface 2. 
but those weren't anything that sold super well, so a lot of people don't really even remember the Tegra 4. It actually used a Cortex A15, same big little with a four core main set, and then a single core that was low powered. They did get the bandwidth up to 14.9 gigabytes, so that is at that time more than what the 360 was pushing. This was of course though in 2013 when we were all looking for the really the PS4 and the Xbox One to come out with things that had massive bandwidth compared to this little guy. This one still ran at 32 bit though, which was still kind of an issue for the memory. 64 bit of course would be next and it would massively help this little chip. The first Tegra that implemented 64 bit technology was the Tegra K1. And this is one that I think a lot of people do kind of remember because this was when they also released development boards for a lot of people with the Jetson TK1. A lot of people kind of remember that with before the Switch came out, there were, we were talking about Jetson boards. Um, and this was one that they did ship out with that to really anyone who wanted to develop for it. They also use it in their NVIDIA Shield tablet, Acer Chromebooks, Lenovo picked it up. There were a lot of different companies that really grabbed a hold of this chip because of how strong it was at the time without pulling a lot of power. Used the Cortex A15, which is a 4 plus 1, which is awesome. And then they even included in a special version, the T132, you actually use the dual core Denver 64 chipset as well, which was great, worked well for it. It actually clocked up to 2.5 gigahertz, which is awesome. And then they did stick with the DDR3 low powered memory, 64 bit bus bandwidth at 17 gigabytes per second. This was of course available after the PS4 and the Xbox One just launched in the second quarter of 2014. And then after just one year, they introduced the Tegra X1. And this is a, a pretty large jump here because the bandwidth itself did move up to 25.6 gigabytes per second. And instead of using Denver, they stuck with the Cortex A57 and Cortex A53, just two quad core configurations. Although a lot of people don't really know, they seem to have the lower set disabled, the A53s, and they really just keep the A57s enabled for quad core use. They also upgraded from Kepler up to Maxwell from the Nvidia side. And what's great here is they have low power DDR4 memory that helps them get up to 25.6 gigabytes per second on a 64 bit bus width. And this actually enables it to be stronger than the 360 and the PS3. And when they first announced this, I remember they showed an entire chart that compared it to just that. They were talking about how they got those consoles on a much lower power chip than what was available at the time. I mean, think about it this way. In the Switch, this Tegra chip pulls roughly 15 watts when you're kind of walking around with it. When the 360 first came out, it had a power brick of 203 watts. And this is a really big deal because the visuals that this little guy is pushing is well above its weight class. Now we already know about the Tegra X2, that is coming up down the road at some point, we assume in some kind of revision for the Switch, but it actually still uses the quad core A57s and then adds Denver cores back in that are higher speed and much more powerful for use in like single thread applications because it's dual core instead of a quad core. But what that means though, is it would be completely backwards compatible with what the X1 is doing. So they could probably slip this in to a revision, like a Switch Pro or something down the road, keep the same compatibility, but effectively double the bandwidth. That's right, it would go up to 58.4 gigabytes, which is pretty close to what the Xbox One was doing with its basic DDR3 RAM, which means things like resolution, possibly frame, frame rate, but more than likely just resolution, would be able to jump up. They might even be able to do things like 900p and 1080p with the Tegra X2. We had Doom announced recently for the X1 that's running at 30 frames per second in a lower resolution. With an X2, I could probably see them really, really really squeezing out 60 frames per second at probably something like a 900p, maybe even 720p resolution, because they probably would incorporate those Denver cores more than just the lower A57s. Now we're not even past the X2 yet with the Switch because they haven't incorporated it at all yet, and we're already talking about the follow-up to that with Xavier. Um, that's actually going to be a CPU that has eight cores, and it's going to be based on Volta, apparently, with what we assume to be right now 512 CUDA cores, which is double the amount of CUDA cores that is in X2 and X1. And that's where it gets exciting, because it looks like NVIDIA, because they're also basing these in their self-driving cars, are on board heavily to keep upgrading this chipset. And really, the whole situation is interesting, because the Tegra X1 has never had a place. It really hasn't. It's been, you know, thrown around in different tablets, different uh, really smartphone devices, everything but a gaming device. And it wasn't until Nintendo came along, talked to them, incorporate into the Switch, develop an entire low-level API for it that's all custom by NVIDIA that really helps game systems punch above their weight class, and now we see what the Tegra line can do. Really, if you take a look at how far the Tegra line has come in about six years, I mean, look at 
really here. This is Riptide GP on the NVIDIA Tegra 2. At one point, NVIDIA was working with other companies to make games specifically for the Tegra line because, well, they're trying to get it off the ground. You can see the visuals here. And now we transfer over. Six years later, here's Doom, a PS4 and Xbox One game running on the Tegra X1. And if that doesn't make you excited for how fast this is evolving, I'm not really sure what will. And now we have the Tegra X2, which doubles the memory bandwidth, and then more than likely, Xavier, that doubles the CUDA core count, and I assume it will probably double the entire bandwidth of the system as well, which would put it well above Xbox One territory, and probably they will start approaching the PS4 territory. And it's going to get very interesting when we get to that point, because resolution will only bump so far. I do see these smaller chipsets, the Tegra's in particular, really getting to a point where there's not going to be as much of a difference unless there is a major cry for 8K. I don't really know if we'll ever get to a point where these chips can't do what the bigger guys can do. I hope this gave you guys a little bit of perspective around the entirety of the Tegra line. I was really into cell phones a while ago when the original Droid phone came out and we really Android broke onto the scene with the, with the Google G1 at the time. And at that point, I was kind of hooked on the different processors and stuff that was coming out because it was kind of an exploding market at the time. Innovation was everywhere. And when Integra 2 broke out on the scene, I was hooked and I've been following it ever since. And it's really cool to see it evolve to the point it is now in just six years. It really is amazing. And that makes me happy for the future. It excited even for the innovation now that the Tegra has found a place, a very profitable place, by the way. So that's where things will be interesting going forward. There's a lot of people who like their 4K visuals, like their, obviously, their, their super high high res images and everything, and I don't blame you. The 4K assets on a 4K screen look great, but to discount the Tegra at its lifespan right now, where it has not been around, it's been around for less time than the entirety of the 360's lifespan, and it's evolved this much. So don't be surprised if in seven, eight years, you're walking through a Walmart, and there's a 4K TV with a display, and it's playing a game, and you're like, wow, this looks really good right now, and then you look down, and it's a Tegra powering it. Don't be surprised if it if the 4K uh, Tegras show up sooner than you think down the line. Thanks guys for watching. I'll see you next time. Hey everybody, it's Kimrex. Just a reminder, Spawnwave Media doesn't stop at just the YouTube channel. We also have a Patreon, which you can support and actually gain access to our community Discord from. Or you can also join in the conversation over at our subreddit. We should have the links in the description below. You can check those out. It's a great way to stay in touch with us, keep up to date on things happening. And they're a great way to keep the community growing, so please check them out, and we'll see you next time.